Number three, the Coney Island Submarine. Before Coney Island was attached to the rest of Brooklyn, it was, as its name implies, an island separated from Brooklyn by a waterway known as Coney Island Creek. It was turned into a peninsula during the 1920s and 30s when the eastern half of the creek was filled in. What's left of the former strait today consists of a 1.8 mile long tidal inlet filled with mysterious crumbling shipwrecks. One particular wreck stands out among the rest, a partially submerged, rusting submarine that has sat in the creek for as long as most people can remember. The listing vessel is in extremely poor condition, making it difficult to gauge its age or origins just by eyesight alone. During the 1960s, a ship worker named Jerry Bianco heard rumors about some sunken U-boats in the waters off Long Island and was compelled to search for them. He was also interested in locating the wreck of the Andrea Doria, an Italian luxury ship that sank off the Nantucket coast in 1956. He believed that the Andrea Doria contained around $6 million worth of scrap metal, so Bianco persuaded investors to fund his ambitions. In order to find the ship, they built a bright yellow submarine called the Quester One. It was finally ready for its maiden voyage in 1971, but it was eight pounds too heavy for the crane that was on standby to place it into the water. So Bianco removed some of the ballast to lighten it. He instructed the crane operator not to lower the submarine into the water until he put the ballast back in, but the driver didn't listen. The crane operator put the sub into the water and it fell on its side. The press and onlookers mistakenly believed that this was Bianco's fault and he became a laughingstock. His investors lost confidence in him even after he proved that the submarine could operate with the proper amount of ballast, and it has remained in Coney Island Creek ever since. It's now a decaying testament to Bianco's dashed dreams. It no longer boasts its vivid yellow paint job, which gave way to corrosion long ago, courtesy of the creek's heavily polluted waters. Number 2. USS Trepang Built during the late 1960s, the USS Trepang was a U.S. Navy Sturgeon-class attack submarine. In early 1971, the vessel departed from its home port in New London, Connecticut for the Arctic, where it spent a month operating beneath the polar ice cap. During that time, its crew carried out data tests on its weapon systems and scientific studies on the ice cap's movements, composition, and geological history. The Trepang had a lengthy but somewhat uneventful career that lasted nearly 30 years, spending much of its time along the eastern seaboard and in the North Atlantic. It was also deployed to the Caribbean, the Mediterranean, and to the Arctic for a second time. In 1978, the FBI arrested two men for allegedly plotting to steal the USS Trepang and sell it for $300 million. Prosecutors initially accused a 24-year-old Missouri man named Edward John Mendenhall and 26-year-old James W. Cosgrove from Rochester, New York, of planning to kill the Trepang's crew and rendezvous at sea with an unidentified buyer. The pair contacted a Missouri businessman named Charles Rosine and asked if he would be willing to help them find a buyer for the submarine. Rosine immediately went to law enforcement, and the FBI convinced him to help them get more information about the plan. In a second phone call, Mendenhall told Rosine that he would need some money up front for supplies and other expenses that were needed to carry out the theft. Razine said that he wouldn't give any cash advances unless Mendenhall came up with a workable plan. The FBI recorded the conversation, along with a third phone call, during which Mendenhall once again asked Razine for money in advance. About a month later, Razine met with Mendenhall and Cosgrove, who presented him with an outline for the plot and a list of supplies that they would need to buy ahead of time. Mendenhall told Razine that a cash advance of $25,000 to $30,000 was needed. He repeated the request during another meeting the following day and was arrested by the FBI shortly thereafter. Mendenhall and Cosgrove were initially charged with conspiracy to steal public property, but prosecutors dropped the indictment at the 11th hour after concluding that the pair were trying to swindle Razine but had no serious plans to steal the Trepang. The change was made without explanation and the judge wasn't too happy about it. Describing the case as crazy and incredibly screwed up, an unnamed source told the Washington Post that the reversal was made because a key witness changed their testimony, and another witness 
was unavailable, Mendenhall's lawyer, Donald L. Wolfe, claimed that prosecutors called the indictment off after interviewing the Trepang's former executive officer, who said that it would be virtually impossible to steal the submarine. Wolf also said that at least one government witness, who was slated to testify at the trial, knew that Mendenhall's plan wasn't real. We'll most likely never know the exact details of what led up to the prosecutor's change of heart, which led to the conspiracy indictment being replaced with allegations of fraud. The bizarre case marked one of the few times that the Trepang made major headlines. Another strange story involving the submarine came sometime during the 2000s when a French paranormal magazine called Top Secret published photos of what appeared to be a UFO. Supposedly, the image was taken by the Trepang's crew during its first Arctic expedition in 1971. According to the article, the images were captured near an uninhabited Norwegian island called Jan Mayen after Officer John Klicka spotted the unexplained objects using the submarine's periscope, the magazine claimed to have received the photos from an unidentified source. With little information to go on, verifying the origins and authenticity of the pictures proved to be more or less impossible. In 2015, some savvy web sleuths claimed to have tracked down Admiral Dean R. Sackett, who reportedly commissioned the Trepang and was on the mission that made the mysterious sighting. According to an article posted on theblackvault.com, Sackett agreed to an interview, but didn't say much about the alleged UFO incident, claiming that he only saw ice. The website's investigators also said that they got in touch with John Klicka, who reported seeing nothing unusual during the mission as well. There's little mention of the UFO photos outside of a handful of paranormal websites, and no verified news sources have reported on it making it hard to distinguish which parts of the story are fact, if any, and which details are fiction. However, it seems as though the Black Vault made a genuine effort to get to the bottom of the case and to provide what little documentation it could find. This includes an official list of the ship's crew and a scanned image of a French magazine article that the photos first appeared in. Even if the conversations with Admiral Sackett really happened, and if he did see a UFO hovering over the Arctic Ocean while aboard the Trepang, it's likely that he's bound by a security oath and can't publicly discuss the matter. If the photos are real, there's no evidence explicitly tying them to the Trepang, indicating that they could have been taken at another place in time by a different submarine. It's also possible, and perhaps even likely, that the photos are doctored, which would explain their complete lack of traceability. One social media user sarcastically commented that if the pictures are real, they're some of the best UFO images the person had ever seen. Reporting for the Fade to Black radio show, which focuses heavily on conspiracy theories, paranormal investigator Alex Mastretta speculated that the images were possibly taken during a military test of some kind and that the test may have involved unusual technology. He admittedly doesn't have any evidence to support this idea and encouraged others who are trying to solve the mystery to consider all possible scenarios. Commenters weighed in with their own theories, with one person remarking that some of the photos look like missiles being launched from the ocean. Another person said that the objects are naval gunnery targets, confidently adding, no mystery here. As things currently stand, anyone's guess is as good as the next person's when it comes to identifying the source of the images and the objects that are in them. Do you think the Trepang could have captured evidence of some type of alien technology in the Arctic? Let us know in the comments below. And while you're at it, hit that subscribe button. Number 1. The Sarkouf At the end of World War I, the conflict's major Allied participants signed an agreement to prevent a future arms race known as the Washington Naval Treaty. One of its stipulations imposed strict size limits on certain naval vessels, including battleships and cruisers. However, the signatories failed to agree on such restrictions when it came to light ships like submarines and destroyers, and France eagerly took advantage of this technicality. At a time when the US and Britain had largely abandoned their submarine development programs, France mounted an aggressive effort to build a powerful submarine fleet. With no size limits to worry about, they went ahead and built the Sarkouf. At 361 feet long, it was the world's largest submarine until Japan's I-400 class subs entered service in 1944. Built during the 1930s, 
the Sarkouf was designed specifically to seek out and engage in surface combat. Its twin-gun turret was equipped with two 8-inch guns with a 60-round magazine capacity, and the ship was fitted with 10 torpedo tubes. The submarine also had a watertight hangar, mounted with anti-aircraft cannon and machine guns. It housed a float plane that was meant for locating potential targets and tracking the fall of shot from the vessel's guns. In addition to being heavily armed, the Sarkouf contained a cargo compartment with room for 40 passengers or prisoners. But for all its might and power, the sub ran into numerous issues starting early on in its career. It rolled badly in choppy waters, and its trim was difficult to adjust. The vessel's gun turrets leaked, and its diesel engines were extremely unreliable. The vessel also dove slowly, taking two minutes to descend to a depth of 39 feet, which made it vulnerable to enemy aircraft. After entering service in 1934, the Sarkouf occasionally operated in the Atlantic and Mediterranean, spending most of its time at sea on the surface. Its future became uncertain in 1940, when Germany invaded France. At the time, the Sarkouf was undergoing repairs in the port city of Brest for a jammed rudder and a busted engine, and it was incapable of diving. After receiving word that Brest would likely be captured by the Germans within three days, the vessel puttered across the English Channel and sought refuge in Plymouth. The British gave the Sarkouf's crew the option of either sailing on the submarine under the newly established Free French Naval Forces or returning to France. All but one sailor ultimately went back to France, including its captain. The new crew members were recruited among the naval officers and sailors who were stranded in England, most of whom were inexperienced with submarines. The British saw little practical use for the Sarkouf, but it was kept in service at the urging of the Free French leader Charles de Gaulle. It spent the majority of 1941 in the Caribbean and along the east coast of North America, where it underwent a complete overhaul in New Hampshire and participated in the invasion of several pro Vichy French Canadian islands. These activities did little to improve sailors' opinions of the ship, with British Admiral Sir Charles Kennedy Purvis describing it as having no operational value and being short of a menace. In early 1942, the submarine left Bermuda for the Panama Canal with plans to sail to Tahiti, then Sydney. With just one working motor, it was incapable of diving or going fast, leaving its crew with no choice but to travel on the surface at a slow speed. It never reached the Panamanian city of Cologne as planned, and it never sent a distress signal. In fact, the Sarkouf was never seen again. The submarine's fate remains a mystery to this day. In the aftermath of its disappearance, Rumors spread like wildfire and included allegations that its crew was loyal to the French Vichy government and had fired torpedoes at an Allied troop carrier. There were also claims that the sub was seen refueling a U-boat. Nearly a month after Sarkouf's disappearance, FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover sent a letter to the Director of Naval Intelligence. It claims that a highly confidential source reported that the submarine sank off the island of Martinique about two weeks after it went missing. Hoover's alleged source was never identified, and the statement in the letter was never explained. The most probable theory suggests that the Sarkouf collided with the American merchant freighter Thompson Likes, which struck an unknown object on the night of February 18, 1942, in the same region the submarine vanished. Crew members observed a cigar-like object in the water shortly before the crash, which was followed by an underwater explosion. They reported hearing cries for help soon after, but said that no objects or people rose to the water's surface. Assuming that they had collided with a U-boat, they carried on without looking any further into the incident. Without any physical trace of the Sarkouf, there's no way to prove whether it was the unfortunate object that the Thompson Likes ran into, but it's the most widely accepted explanation, and until or unless the wrecked submarine is found, that's as close as anyone can get to solid proof. Would you rather take a cruise or ride in a submarine? Let us know what you think in the comments below, and don't forget to subscribe. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.